Welcome back to Le Monde. We have just heard in Circular 360 how a circular economy affects all of society and will have major impacts on well-being. Welcome to Circularity at Home. I'm now happy to introduce the host of today's session, Alice Irene Whitaker, a circular, a circular lifestyles expert who is writing a book explaining her own imperfect path towards a circular life. Bonjour, Alice Irene. Bonjour. Good afternoon, Alice Irene. Hi, Chuck. Here's your hot chocolate. Thank you very much. Cheers. Let's sit down. Thank you. Alice Irene, tell me, what does it mean to you to have and to live a circular lifestyle? Thanks, Chuck. So for me, at its heart, it's actually about how we as humans can live in concert with nature cycles. That's it. And because we live in this extractive, exploitative system mm. right now, that's going to take a lot of repair, yep. right? We need to repair our relationships with each other, mm -hmm. with ourselves, our relationship with the natural world, with our ecosystems, our communities. Mm -hmm. And the way we do that is with our own hands, in our own homes, mm -hmm. by taking different actions every day that work with our talents, our perspectives, our mm -hmm. resources. And we're going to talk about a few of those today. Some of them we're very familiar with, right? Mm -hmm. Like repairing things and mending them so they last longer, mm -hmm. uh, reducing how much we use in the first place, mm -hmm. or even just refusing what we don't agree with, what we don't need, what we don't want, even though we're told that we do. Mm -hmm. But there are also parts of it that we don't talk about as much, like reimagining the way we live in society together, mm -hmm. or uh, you know, reimagining our relationship to stuff, mm -hmm. you know, and value. What does that mean to us? Is this how we want to live? Mm -hmm. And the beautiful thing about it that we were talking about earlier is we don't have to be perfect, yeah. right? I can't do this alone. You can't do it alone. Mm -hmm. We don't need to have the weight of the world on our shoulders mm -hmm. and all of this guilt when we don't do it properly. Mm -hmm. Instead, our power is in doing it collectively. And luckily, we have all of these beautiful examples to learn from. Nature cycles, for one. Mm -hmm. I get a lot of my inspiration from the beauty and wisdom of the way that nature works, and mm -hmm. that's a lifelong journey reconnecting with that. Or like we heard so beautifully earlier mm -hmm. today, indigenous cultures, cultures mm -hmm. around the world, have a lot of knowledge and mm -hmm. wisdom that we can learn from as well. Excellent point, Alice Irene. And you know, as people in what is currently Canada, it is imperative that we take our cues and understandings of circularity from the people who have lived on this land since time immemorial and have curated ways of being that are inherently circular. I encourage all of our audience, all of you uh, listening to us today, to, regardless of country, to think of the cultures and peoples embedded in the history of the land upon which you find yourselves and what you can learn from them. In recognizing the inherent linearity in our lives, uh, because most of us live in linear and unsustainable economies, uh, we recognize that, syst that the systems you are in play a huge role in the choices for circular action and lifestyles made available to you. Um, as we were talking earlier, Alice, Irene, one of the things that you mentioned is this feeling of guilt if we're not perfect, this feeling of guilt if we're not, if we're not these incredible, perfectly circ living these perfectly circular lifestyles regardless of the systems we're in. And so this session, you know, seeks not to minimize the role of societal change in curating and creating circularity, but to offer up some inspiration and ideas as to individual actions that we can take to create circularity in our own lives. Mm -hmm. um, just to really emphasize this disclaimer, we are cognizant of the various physical, social, cultural, and structural barriers that exist that may limit one's ability to act at an individual level, but this session really seeks to inspire, not impose. And so with that in mind, please take it away, Alice Irene. Thanks, Chuck. It's so good to be here with you. Thank you for that. So throughout this session today, we'll be asking you to complete three polls related to three major areas of impact that we can all have in our homes, consumption, food, and waste. The results of each poll will be fed into Citra's Smart Actions Calculator to determine the cumulative impact of everyone online with us today. And I get chills when I think of that, all of that rippling out all around the world. In the next segment, we'll explore different ways that we can improve our choices by understanding our motivations and taking smart actions for a better, more circular world. 
So joining me from their homes today are Lindsay Boyle, Emma Sorenanen, and Leonard Aya Miramye. Welcome to you all today. Emma, how are you? Thank you for joining us from Helsinki, Finland, where you're the climate delegate for the Finnish National Youth Association, and you're working as a trainee at Citra. I heard you've also embraced urban farming. Can you give us a quick intro introduction to the motivational profiles work that Citra has done and apply it to yourself? I'd love to hear what motivates you. Great, thanks for the question, and I'm so happy to be here. So the Citrus Motivation Profiles, um, they showcase how different lifestyles based on very different motivations and values can lead us citizens to live lives compatible with the 1.5 degree target. And Citra has actually just released an update on the seven motivation profiles. So if you're interested, please check the chat for more information. Out of the seven profiles, I personally identify most as an uncompromising eco-warrior. Um, things that motivate me include the concern for the environment, local nature, fairness and equality, and being an example to others. So, for example, I learned a few years ago that conventional agriculture is significantly compromising food security and nutritional value of our food through the depletion of topsoil. Um, actually, FAO estimated that we might have only 60 harvests left if we continue a business as usual. And this is extremely worrying, which is why I got motivated to do something about it and decided that I want my food to be part of the solution instead of part of the problem. So the first thing I did was to join an organic food cooperative from where I pick up locally grown and sustainably produced food once a week. Getting locally grown food is really great, but even better for me as a hands-on person, it has been renting a community garden plot where I have been growing part of my own vegetables for three years now. And I absolutely love digging my hands in the soil. To ramp up the circularity of my gardening, I also learned to compost last year. I had no idea composting in an apartment building in the middle of a city is even possible, but with a Bokashi composter, I'm actually able to produce all the soil I need for my garden. Thank you, Emma, that's wonderful. I also love digging my hands in the soil, so I really connect with you on that, and I think that's pretty universal in a way that we can connect with the land and with each other. Leonard, over to you next. So thank you for joining us from Yuhanga, southern province in Rwanda, which I understand is one of Africa's fastest growing economies. You're actively working in your community to inspire others to adopt circular lifestyles and as a Youth for Nature global ambassador. Like Emma, I hear that you identify as the eco-warrior. So I'd love to hear from you, what was the last circular choice that you made and why? Thank you so much, and I'm excited to be here. Uh, my last circular lifestyle that I chose, I made is that I choose to, to go green because um, this is very important. And going green, I use like uh, four words, which are reuse, lead use, recycle, and repair. Those are uh, words that everybody could be uh, choosing to, to use, but specifically for me and from Rwanda, which is green country. So um, I, I use those words by designing out words and pollution. So, what I did, I created a platform or a campaign where we train uh, local people and sharing knowledge how to use waste, use them for well-being and recycling them. So especially we use uh, plastic materials and metallic waste, that, uh, that those containers that, are, that were used and that are ready to go to dump site, but we do not uh, encourage them to dump them where, but we use them for growing and creating uh, gardens where they can cultivate vegetables and flowers so so that they may have um, uh, link those things and um, get uh, their vegetables, especially those 
for those people who do not own land or those who are not uh, able to find land, but they can grow their vegetables, which are fresh, without buying them. So, uh, as you know, uh, circular economy, for me, it is equal to um, health environment and health food. So without food, you know, we can all die. So, but uh, circular lifestyle, it is a good approach to minimize waste. And you know that uh, waste is an indicator of uh, fair in uh, circular economy uh, efficiency. So people are no longer see waste here in Rwanda, but they see waste as low material to change their life. And uh, this is really motivated because uh, circular economy means a lot. and uh, is also wise use of natural resources. And it's also facilitate regeneration, reduce also greenhouse gases and promote green growth. So, Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Leonard. And there's lots in there. And I, I see connections, again, to that redefining our idea of waste and what is that and, and community and the power there. So thank you for that. And over to you, Lindsay. Uh, you're a fellow Canadian mom. You have uh, two children. You live on Vancouver Island, uh, and where you work as a senior associate at One Earth. I'm a big admirer of, of your work and looking forward to talking about it. So similarly to Emma, you've recently conducted research on people's motivations. Why are people out there living in a circular way, but in your province of British Columbia, Canada? So I'd love to hear from you, what was the last circular choice that you made and what motivated you personally? Thank you, Alice Irene. I'm so excited to be having this conversation today. The last circular choice I made had to be choosing secondhand clothes for my kids going back to school last week. Uh, my boys are nine and 13, and we went to a fantastic secondhand shop, uh, a retail shop called Blue Toque for their uh, new ice hockey equipment, which is very Canadian, but they play ice hockey. Um, and then for everything else that they needed for school, uh, we shopped at an, on an app called Poshmark. And um, so, you know, doing that action, but I also um, really love talking to other parents about Poshmark as an option. Um, you know, I'm, I don't really push it, but I just talk about the positive experience we've had buying secondhand clothes through that app. And then, you know, at home, I really talk to my kids about the circular economy and why secondhand clothes are a solution to a lot of the waste and fossil fuels and emissions in the fashion industry. So they understand uh, and they, they really get how their choice to buy secondhand clothes is part of the solution to a lot of the big issues that, you know, they're fearful about. Thanks, Lindsay. And uh, I actually got my dress on uh, that app, and I'm a huge fan. So this is when our conversation will just be all about circular fashion for the rest of the time, I guess. Um, but uh, I've, I've seen with my kids as well that it uh, is an idea that really resonates and makes sense. And it's easy for people to grasp at, at any age. Uh, so I'd love to hear again uh, from you, Leonard. You're actively promoting circular lifestyles in your community, and I'd love to hear why that's important to you and what the role of community has in your work. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, uh, I've, I've been looking for uh, three main challenges that uh, the planet is facing, which are biodiversity loss, climate change, and, po uh, and pollution. So uh, by bringing concept of circular economy, it should be uh, the solution to uh, those challenges cause uh, circular economy, this concept should be spread everywhere and make sure that no, it is for every individual. That's why I focus on local people. So it is, it is, we make sure that it is not for one individual. So we need involvement of everybody, rich, poor, and small and big companies should be uh, involved in these activities because ecosystem you know has no border if i do something which is going to harm environment here in rwanda it will also uh, affect everywhere and everyone in the planet so 
uh, we practice uh, this by uh, uh, pre preventing us to promote linear economy, but uh, circular economy. So the impact will be to everyone on the group. So it is important to promote the idea and make sure no one left behind. That's why I also uh, always call upon schools, uh, organization, government, so that we may promote this lifestyle at home level, especially. And shifting to circular economy, uh, extend beyond the economy and it, into a uh, natural environment. By designing out waste and pollution, allows keeping product and material in use instead of disposing them. So, and regenerating rather than degrading natural ecosystem and also improve well-being and food security. Thank you. That's, that's really interesting, and I love this call for everyone to do what they can, doesn't matter who they are, and, and that's going to look very different based on who someone is and what they have available to them. So I love that, uh, that thread there as well, and what you talked about designing, right? We're designing out waste, designing out pollution, and seeing that our roles in our homes are not just contained to our homes, but also our role in public life and what we can affect there. Emma, you're also a youth advocate for the environment. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. What is the main challenge that you're facing in your city in relation to your goal to live sustainability? So what's, or sustainably rather, so what is it that's holding you back that you have to grapple with on this, this journey and how are you typically overcoming it? An interesting question. Um, just maybe to build a bit back on what Leonard said, I love this idea that everyone or all of us, we are connected and all of us, we need to find our own place to um, be and act. But also building on the idea, I think we need to learn from each other. And well, I would say definitely the biggest problem still in Finland and many of the richer nations is that we have been brought up in this lifestyle where overconsumption is the norm. So somehow breaking that down and finding a new way of being and a new, hap new definition for happiness that does not involve overconsumption, but where happiness comes maybe more from relationships or something not consuming. So I think that is that is the huge problem. And well, what I have been really inspired to do in the last past months is to learn, learn from other communities and from the ideas of other thinkers. For example, I have really enjoyed during um, this event that we have included indigenous voices in the discussion. Um, I think we should really have a deeper look at the the holistic views that indigenous culture is how they see the world and how they look at nature and we could really learn something for their them so keeping my eyes open that's really riveting to hear about that and you said that so eloquently uh, and i think that that work of redefining our relationships uh, to each other and to what happiness is is uh, you know, with the predominant cultural stories that we've had, it, it, for many of us, it's going to be a lot of hard work, a lifetime of work to undo those. And uh, I think that's what's exciting about these conversations is what we're building and starting, looking at old and new and, and forging our own new stories in this. So uh, beautifully put. Uh, I have one more question here for you, Lindsay. Uh, you know, when you're talking about uh, you know, you mentioned something about how you suggest uh, secondhand clothing, for example, to parents, but you don't necessarily prescribe it or tell them they should do it necessarily. I'd love to hear how you motivate people to embrace circular living without sounding preachy or without adding an element of guilt to it. I really think that is the question. Um, and I personally really grapple with that uh, that question. So I, I draw on my research with One Earth, where we adapted Citra's profiles for British Columbia, Canada um, in the last year. And we found seven diverse motivations for why people make choices 
for how to live and what to buy. And I think just seeing that there are seven, you know, help me have empathy for people who are motivated differently than I am. And also the big finding is that, you know, really there are many people making circular choices at home um, or in their daily lives, but they're not necessarily doing it because they're consciously motivated by climate change like I am. So I'll go back to my kids. Um, I really hope that my kids grow up to, to, to be like Emma and Leonard and, you know, really be questioning consumption and, and you know, the, the value of different cultures and, and indigenous wisdom, you know, but, but my oldest is 13 and he's, he's in that stage of life where, you know, he's, um, you know, he, he cares about style and he really cares about his, what his friends think. And, um, you know, and he has certain brands that he, he really, you know, wants to, wants to buy uh, with his own money. So, you know, while I prefer to shop at a second home hand store because it also helps local businesses, um, he's, he was resisting that. And so that was truly a real battle. Um, and so, instead of forcing that he you know go to thrift stores or secondhand stores you know i really realized that you know he's motivated by this experience of shopping online um and he's very social he wants to kind of check out what his friends think of things clothing that he might buy so you know really watching him use poshmark i'm seeing that he's discovering features in that app that actually make it even better for him to shop um secondhand than to buy new so there's a feature where he can counter offer on the price so if he thinks a pair of adidas shoes you know should be 65 dollars instead of 80 and he gets his offer approved he can save 15 dollars and so um, you know, and he can also send the link to his friend to say, what do you think of these shoes? Should I get them? Should I not? So he is finding ways that actually buying secondhand is better um, than buying in a linear, um, you kind of, new, you know, buying new, but it's not because his mom told him to. Um, it's because there's benefits provided through the features and, um, you know, the platform that Poshmark provides. That's great. And, you know, no one does things because they're told to do them. And, you know, when you're talking about how he's going to pick up on this, I think over time he'll probably take things from what he's seen and how you're living. And I think that applies to all of us when we embrace circularity in our own homes or in our own behaviors. Other people see them and they become more uh, accepted or we can set an example for others as well if it's something we're passionate about. So I want to say a heartfelt thank you to Lindsay, Emma, and Leonard. It's so great to have you here today. Uh, it's very inspiring thinking of all of us in our pockets of the globe doing what we can and how that kind of stitches together. So it's great to be talking with you today. I appreciate it. So I wanted to talk to everyone out there. Uh, did you know that a significant portion of your greenhouse gas emissions are dependent on the type of food you eat? So reducing food waste, eating leftovers, and eating more locally produced food are things that all of us can incorporate into our daily lives. On your screen, you'll see a second poll related to food. Hi, Chuck. Oh, hi, Alyssa Irene. Welcome back. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. So what did you take from that discussion? That was a really interesting discussion. And I like that it was an international discussion where we have three, uh, three people from three uh, different countries that are quite different in the way they function, in the values they hold, in the cultures they espouse, in the way their society is structured. And to sort of see the actions that individuals who are very nature conscious are taking um, as a means to sort of be circular and as a means to sort of reduce um, the idea of waste and really create and support that whole idea of a circular economy. Something that um, our NVT from Finland, uh, what, something that she said struck me where it was like, we really need to start trying to define happiness via the connections we make instead of the things we have. And I thought that was very, very powerful because that's something that I think resonates with quite a lot of us where you know, we want the latest gadget, we want the latest thing, we want to you know, dress a certain way. And so 
you know, really sort of defining our joy and our happiness via the connections we make, the people we chat with, that adds this richness that, um, that I think often is missing from discussions such as these, right? Because discussions such as these are so focused on numbers that we often forget the human element. So really, once again, tying into that idea of listening to people, listening to people's wants and needs and desires. Yeah, that is Irene. Thank you very much. Yeah, it is those human uh, connections and stories that are going to motivate most of us in our own homes versus the numbers which reach certain people. But if we're trying to truly have people embrace this and create momentum, mm -hmm. it is really those real life examples that bring it to life. Absolutely, absolutely. A third poll has been activated with potential sharing and recycling actions. So I encourage everyone to please vote and we can take a look at what everyone is embracing out there. Parfait. And while everyone is voting, let me introduce the next segment of our little circularity at home moment. Um, so in this next part, we can tur we're turning from what individuals can do in their own homes. We had three individuals in their own homes in three different parts of the world sharing what they can do. So in, we're turning from that and we're looking to what we can accomplish together as a community. Um, I think that's been a recurring theme that we've heard all throughout today is the idea of listening to community, the idea of supporting community, the idea of really centering community, centering values. And so we're going to do that right now. We're going to talk, we're going to talk with organizations and companies that really sort of center community at the, at the heart of the operations and support community in enabling people to have the option to make some circular decisions in their lifestyles. So Alice Irene, I'm going to leave it to you and um, I'm excited to listen. Great, thanks Chuck. So I am very happy to introduce to you Ryan Fukunaga, the Executive Director of Free Geek Toronto, a technology reuse social enterprise which refurbishes and sells used electronics and shares knowledge too about how to refurbish electronics. Welcome, Ryan. Hi, thank you. It's so great to be here with you. <laughs> yeah. So I'd love to ask, uh, could you please talk a little bit about how you're making it easier for people to embrace a circular lifestyle with what you're doing? Um, yeah, I think there's, so there's lots of organizations all across the world that really are doing similar things to us that are really focused on trying to reuse technology um, for, to, for social good, you know, to get people to have the ability to have uh, access to technology when they might not always have it in their communities. And so what we're doing is we're trying to offer, offer that opportunity for people to either donate the things they don't need anymore because, you know, what might not be good for the graphic designer is perfectly good for the student to use at home, right? And then also for the people who maybe on the other end of it who may not have access to find high quality, low cost uh, technology. And then for the people in between who really want to, you know, actually get involved in it, offer opportunities to be able to do, to do that as well. Great, really interesting, and I want to pick up on a couple of things in a minute. Uh, so thanks for kicking it off. But next, I'd like to introduce Tessa Clark, the CEO and co-founder of Olio, a mobile app with almost 4 million users that connects neighbors with each other and local businesses to increase food sharing and reduce food waste. Olio really has redefined sharing among neighbors. So Tessa, it's great to see you. Thanks so much for being here with Hi. us today. Great to be with you. So I'd love to hear from you, how does your app help people improve circularity and their relationship with it? So Olio is a free app that exists to tackle the enormous problem of waste that we have in our homes. And we do that by connecting people with their neighbors so they can give away rather than throw away their spare food and other household items. So the app is really simple to use. You just snap a photo of your spare food or perhaps it's a um, camping stove you don't want uh, and you add it to the app. Neighbors living nearby get an alert. They can browse to the listings, request what they want, and pop around and pick it up. And what's really amazing about Olio is just how strong the demand for this surplus food and other household items is. So half of all the food added to the app is requested in less than half an hour. And half of all the non-food items are requested in less than four hours. And we are absolutely thrilled um, that we've passed some sort of major milestones recently. So our community has collectively saved 25 million portions of food and also 3 million uh, non-food items from the bin. And the environmental impact of this is enormous. It's equivalent to taking 80 million car miles off the road. And we've also saved 4 billion liters of water. And 
sort of the real magic of Olio actually is sort of harnessing the power of mobile technology and connecting it with uh, local communities. Because what we've discovered is that nobody likes wasting anything, but the reason why people throw away food, for example, is because we're no longer connected to our neighbors. We no longer have anyone to give our surplus food to. And Olio solves that problem by making sharing with your neighbors simple, safe, fast and fun. And our community now actually is almost 5 million people um, all over the world. So roughly 20% of our sharing is taking place kind of outside of the UK every single day. Thanks, Tessa. There's some really staggering impact there. Merci, Tessa. En peu de crise, les connexions avec les voisins sont très importantes. Alors, on a dit comment il n'y a pas de façon unique, qu'il n'y a pas de voie unique vers un mode de vie circulaire. Quel est l'usager typique? L'usager typique, ce sont des gens qui ne veulent pas que des choses parfaites soient mises au rebut. Vous ne pouvez pas vous servir de quelque chose, mais ça ne veut pas dire que ça n'a aucune valeur. Il y a quelqu'un qui peut s'en servir. Dans la technologie, il y a bien des gens qui ont du plaisir, qui trouvent du plaisir à démonter les choses. Geek, tu entends le mot geek. Nous voulons employer les outils disponibles pour vraiment. Peut-être que la motivation n'est pas l'économie circulaire. Est-ce que je peux que ces idées continuent, puissent continuer de fonctionner? Est-ce que cette chose peut servir à quiconque? C'est une chose que de construire à ma entreprise, mais c'est tellement plus stimulant quand quelqu'un d'autre peut s'en servir. Alors, nous voulons être certains qu'il y ait du plaisir. C'est facile d'oublier la, la joie et le plaisir. La communauté est au cœur de Léo, vous l'avez dit. Quel est le rôle qu'a eu le Léo pour augmenter le bien-être communautaire? Vous avez raison. Elio est un cœur qui basse la collectivité. Nous faisons de lien entre les gens dans la vie réelle, au foyer. Les gens se joignent à Elio parce qu'ils détestent le gaspillage. Ils s'en servent toujours. Ils aiment bien relier la collectivité, se sentir habilité qui font une différence. Ils ont fait un sondage avec nos communautés plus de... 80 se disent moins seuls depuis qu'ils sont membres de Léo. 40 de Léo ont dit qu'ils ont fait des amis, connu des amis par l'appli. Ça, c'est ce qui est très puissant. Et les gens bâtissent ces relations. Which is what we have collectively... Ensemble, nous l'avons vu pour la COVID, nous avons vu un accroissement énorme de l'usage de l'appli. Les gens recherchent ont un désir de connecter avec leurs voisins. Alors, l'activité de partage dans le pli d'Aolio augmente de cinq fois. Encore une fois, c'est ce mariage parfait de techno et de communauté. C'est tellement puissant. C'est très puissant. Merci, Tassa. What role does a community-based organization have in moving towards these circular lifestyles? So we see it as kind of, it's a, it, our mission is to uh, make the, the access less, so to lessen the barriers mm -hmm. to people trying to learn about this stuff. Because especially with like trying to reuse technology, there's so many things that people don't know and they think they're worried about, but, some, like, there, are, but there can be things that they can do to make it better very quickly you know like there are little things to maintenance and stuff like that that they can do and so our goal here is that like while we can only train our volunteers because we're a small organization we really do try and emphasize that like anything you can, any steps you can take you it's you're already working better if you make your computer last an extra month or two that's one more month or two you don't have to go out and think about buying something else or think and stuff like that so it's really it's really about kind of offering that opportunity for people to kind of communicate talk learn and you know just 
kind of understand that they don't have to be fully in this idea of like, you know, being completely green, that like if they take this one step of like just maybe choosing a refurbished computer or choosing to extend the life of their technology, that can have a meaningful impact uh, to creating a circular economy and also maybe might be something they consider bringing that into other aspects of their life going forward. Lovely. It's uh, that uh, progress, not perfection, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, thanks so much for being here, Ryan. It's really great to chat. And thank you so much, Tessa, for joining us today. I really enjoyed uh, this conversation and look forward to learning more as well. Thank so you. now it is time to have a look at the impact that our audience's smart choices are having and how they're all adding up. So hello again, Chuck. Nice to see you again. Hello, Alice Irene. I'm enjoying all these conversations that you're having. They are absolutely fascinating. And I'm having similar conversations with the crew in the back as I sort of listening to what people are saying. Um, but to the point, I have some numbers for you. So I have the results of our polls as calculated by friends from Citra. Altogether, we received um, over 1,300 responses. So look at that. And many more of you are currently online. Um, and so get excited for some big numbers. The total impact of the smart actions and choices made by all of you is equivalent to driving more than a million kilometers. Um, that is equivalent to driving 29 times around the world, or in a Canadian context, uh, driving 288 times around Canada which is the second largest country in the world. So it's a big deal, big deal. And so let's break our results down by category. On the screen behind us, you can see a comparison of the benefits of different repair and care actions. Uh, some smart actions are smarter than others. Ah, fantastic, it has appeared. Um, some smart actions are smarter than others. Uh, for example, you'll notice that repairing something is better than using reusable shopping bags instead of a plastic one, for example. So this is sort of a scaling of impacts. And that is not to say you shouldn't use reusable shopping bags if you're able to, just simply doing a scaling of impacts, essentially. Um, so through repairing and caring every day, we, all of us here today have offset the equivalent of driving 144,493 kilometers, which wow. is a very precise number. Um, <laughs> and then the most popular option in the group uh, that people had selected was reusing shopping bags. But the greatest total impact is created by moving to a smaller home. And so that's something that's really interesting in a Canadian context because you know, we tend to size up, right? We, are one of the least densely populated countries in the world. And so we have a habit of you know, going for big homes, bigger houses, maybe more rooms than we need. What are some of your thoughts, Alice Irene? Well, I like that idea of you know, doing less or sometimes doing nothing at all is actually an action versus doing more or bigger, right? Sure. So we often forget about that. But there's a lot of power sometimes in just retreating or refusing to do something at all or moving to a smaller home, like you mentioned. Mm. Absolutely, and so it also speaks to um, that idea of redefining cultural traits such that moving to a small home is seen as a sign of success rather than moving to a bigger home. And so speaking of lifestyle choices and the idea of moving to homes, um, let's talk about food uh, because you eat food in a home. Do you see that transition? Food in a home, there we go. Uh, so our audience clearly has ambitions to reduce food impact, with eating leftovers being the most popular action. Through our communal food choices, we have reduced emissions equivalent to driving 363,728 kilometers. It's incredible. Hmm. Impressed? I am impressed. You know, when you th <laughs> start to add them up and think about what one person does, does this matter? Am I wasting my time? But then when you actually start to add them up, mm -hmm. it means something, right? No, that's absolutely true. And I, uh, what I really like is the idea of eating leftovers. I don't think seems to most people like an environmental choice. You're eating leftovers because you maybe don't want to waste food. Maybe you really enjoyed that meal that you cooked and you want to eat it the second time. Um, or maybe simply you are saving money by simply just not throwing away food and buying something new when you could eat something that's remaining. Yet that's an incredibly environmental action because that is indeed reducing emissions and that is indeed making a difference. Um, and now let's finally look at the final set of actions, which is le recyclage, recycling. So many of these choices were also popular and um, most of you are probably doing more than one action that you answered. I saw a couple of comments in the Slido asking to be able to select more than one thing and completely understand. Uh, we were just sort of playing with the numbers so we could only allow you to select one thing. But essentially, 
by sharing and recycling, we're reducing our cumulative G, uh, greenhouse gas emissions by an amount equivalent to driving 645,114 kilometers. Um, the most popular actions amongst our audience were recycling and buying secondhand products. Yeah, that's something that I love to do mm -hmm. is buying secondhand and then you still get that experience of getting what you need or, or want. So that's really interesting and uh, hear that, that people wanted more choices so that it would actually be yeah. even greater when we think about people doing mm -hmm. a few of these actions. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And this, this entire discussion has just been absolutely fascinating, right? Because when you sort of mix in the whole idea of we're all doing small things, just by eating leftovers, you're contributing to a circular economy. Recycling, that's contributing to a circular economy. Um, reusing, buying secondhand. These are so many absolutely sort of fascinating, fascinating pieces. So, Alice Irene, I'm going to turn to you. Merci tout d'abord. Merci énormément d'avoir come. Thank you. I've been, for having been a spectacular moderator. You were spectacular. And absolutely interesting to listen to. And so, moi, je te remercie au fond de mon cœur. Et comme, je crois qu'essentiellement... Uh, uh, Thank you from the bottom of my heart. I think the public shares my opinion. Un grand merci to... A, a big thank you. A single one of you from with the ones who joined us on stage to the ones who joined us at distance were all phenomenal and engaging. And, you know, that's that's... It's, it's a richness that we had you in our studios and we were able to hear from your experiences and your wisdom. And so I'm going to turn to you, Alice Irene. Summarize this for us. What are some of your key takeaways? Well, merci. Thank you for those kind Thank you. I think the two key takeaways for me is one is that people care about this. It would be easier for the people we talked with today not to spend their hours trying to make this change, right? It would be easier to just go along with uh, what's already happening, but it's people don't like what's already happening and they care. And so by extending that care in our actions, in our homes and with our community, we have this uh, real power to actually change what we're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and that to me is, uh, you know, we do it because we care, not because we know how it's going to end up mm -hmm. or that this may, you know, will solve everything. Mm -hmm. But we're putting our all into it because we're human beings and we're a part of nature and we do care about this home of ours, this mother of ours. And so it's inspiring to me to see that. Uh, and the second one is, you know, seeing how, you know, when you talk about individual actions or our homes, it's easy to get into this, you know, these are the, this isn't the important part, this no. is the small part. But really this is, you know, our systems, our institutions are made up by individuals who all have a home. And so how we are in that home, how we uh, model things for others, how we go out into the world, you know, that is uh, really, really uh, what makes the difference. And this is our system to redesign. Uh, we, it's ours, it, it belongs to us. So I'm excited to see how from our homes rippling outwards to our communities and our ecosystems, we can really uh, embrace the circular economy and circular living. Whoa, that is... Ooh, give me a second. I was touched by literally everything you just said. Um, I want to take a moment to encourage anyone who lives in countries with strong, thriving indigenous populations to learn from the people who've been living on that land since time immemorial. Learn from the cultures that have been developed and grown in tandem with the land. Um, because there's so much that can be gained from traditional ecological knowledge. So throughout today's session, we did focus quite a bit on science, but there is so much that we can gain from traditional ecological knowledge, and that should be taken into consideration as well. Um, during this session, we have had the opportunity to see that businesses, that local businesses and organizations are important to the transition to a circular economy. And so while we spent a little bit of time fo talking about the home, and uh, I switched into a bathroom to, fo to be uh, more homely with the audience, create this little vibe of home, um, I will have to sprint and change back into a suit for businesses. But essentially, <laughs> our next session uh, focuses especially on small, medium enterprises and how they can be financially successful in embedding and supporting circularity. So for everyone listening, reste à la fuit. Um, so, stay tuned. It's going to be a bumpy ride in a good way. Ciao, tout le monde. Ciao, everybody.